respect the ceasefire. Pope Francis makes a plea for peace as he meets with bishops from Ukraine. Christian unity. A Coptic Orthodox leader meets his Catholic counterpart in D.C. after Christians are beheaded in Libya. No let up in sight, bracing for another frigid, icy weekend in the eastern half of the U.S. And fishtail. On this first Friday of Lent, we revisit some options for meat-free fast food dining. Those stories and more on EWTN News Nightly for Friday, February 20th, 2015. Good evening from Washington. Thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with your news now. Well, there are fresh reports that separatist rebels are still firing on government positions in eastern Ukraine. Meanwhile, Pope Francis is calling for Ukraine's ceasefire to be respected. Francis says he's praying for peace and that, quote, all interested parties apply the agreements that were reached by common accord. The Holy Father delivered the plea for peace during today's meeting with Ukrainian bishops visiting Rome. The bishops agree that peace must come before our political differences in the region can be resolved. Russia is aggressor, but we need peace in Ukraine and Russia. But I think God has this way. God prepare some solution. We need pray and we meet together and we, we, will, we will find this solution. Pope Francis urges these bishops to focus on being pastors and stay out of the political conflict. The continued violence is raising doubts about the viability of a long-term ceasefire. Wyatt Goolsby joining us now with the latest. Brian, the fighting seems far from over. In the last 24 hours, the rebels have fired on Ukrainian territory nearly 50 times using rockets, artillery, and armored vehicles. It comes as the rebels are celebrating their victory over Ukrainian forces in another key city. Rebel fighters rejoice a day after Ukrainian forces began to withdraw from the besieged town of Dubultseva. All of the town's neighborhoods are now under the control of rebel fighters, waving Cossack and Russian flags. Fighters stomped on the Ukrainian flag, and this elderly woman welcomed the rebel fighters, saying in Russian, thank you to those who saved us. Yet Ukraine's president says the pro-Russian rebels have destroyed the city. The situation is becoming more severe because with the support of the Russian army, Militants virtually wiped out Debultseva from the surface of the earth. And now Debultseva reminds me of the moon landscape. President Poroshenko speaking in Kiev with EU leaders says peacekeepers are needed. Meanwhile, Russian officials say the crisis settlement should be based on measures within the latest Minsk agreement, hammered out just last week. We don't know the details of this initiative. We also don't know the aims and the mandate of the possible peacekeeping operation. We proceed from the fact that the upcoming crisis settlement in Ukraine should be based on the range of measures stated in the Minsk agreements. Yet the battle for the city raged on despite the ceasefire that was called into effect on Sunday. The European leaders who oversaw those peace talks say they've spoken with their counterparts in Ukraine and Russia about ceasefire violations and their consequences. French President Francois Hollande and German Chancellor Angela Merkel both signaling their determination to salvage the ceasefire deal and keep both sides talking. People in Ukraine's capital have been paying tribute to those who lost their lives in violent clashes. It was one year ago today when about 100 Ukrainians were killed. They died after demonstrations and riot police exchanged gunfire. Brian. Thank you, Wyatt Coolsby. Now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. Terrorists connected with ISIS now claim responsibility for a series of bombings. They say these attacks were in retaliation for the killings of Muslims in Darna by the Egyptian military. Egypt has been attacking the town by air after militants linked to the ISIS allegedly beheaded 21 Coptic Christians in Libya. Egypt has also been trying to drum up support from its neighbors in the fight. A Coptic bishop and a Catholic cardinal come together after the beheadings of 21 Coptic Orthodox in Libya. Jason Calvi was at that meeting in D.C. today. He's at the Capitol now with that story. Jason? Brian, the Coptic Orthodox bishop says the beheadings of his brothers in faith cannot become yesterday's news. That's a message he brought all the way from the United Kingdom here to our nation's capital. Coptic Orthodox Bishop Angelos of the United Kingdom meets today with Cardinal Donald Wuerl. This is not just a crime against Coptic Christians. This is a crime against Christianity. It's a crime against people of faith. It's a crime against humanity. 
The visit comes less than a week after the Islamic State's release of shocking video. It showed the beheadings of Coptic Christians from Egypt who were working in Libya. As Pope Francis said, they're martyrs. They died simply because they believe in Jesus Christ. We have to lift up our voice, all of us. We're all brothers and sisters. Today's roundtable also featured the chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. If we do not respond robustly to the threat that is posed by groups like ISIS that uh, beheaded those 21 Coptic Christian men, we will find that these values by which we have lived our lives and by which we want to live our lives um, will be under very grave threat. A group called In Defense of Christians organized today's roundtable. They're urging people to join in a day of action next Wednesday. It's a day of prayer, a day to call elected officials, and a day to make donations to help Christians in the Middle East. Brian? All right, Jason Calvi, thank you. The Kansas Senate votes today to legally redefine and ban dismemberment abortion. This is a procedure used in the second trimester of pregnancy. Similar legislation is pending in Missouri and Oklahoma. If the bill passes, the Kansas House... Pro-life Governor Sam Brownback has pledged to sign it. Now, the legislation was drafted by the National Right to Life Committee as part of an effort to incrementally restrict abortion. That committee today expressed pleasure with the bipartisan vote in Kansas. With a clear definition of dismemberment abortion, the committee believes people are less likely to support it. San Francisco's archbishop writes to California lawmakers, asking them to respect his right to hire people who uphold Catholic teachings. The letter is a response to lawmakers asking Archbishop Salvatore Cordelion to remove morality clauses from a teacher's handbook. In his letter, the Archbishop asked the question of legislators, would you hire a campaign manager or advocates who advocates policies contrary to those you stand for and who shows disrespect for you and the Democratic Party in general? And the Archbishop concludes in the letter, I respect your right to employ or not employ whomever you wish to advance your mission. I simply ask the same respect from you. Rabbi David Saperstein is officially sworn in today as ambassador at large for religious freedom. He is the first non-Christian to hold the position which has been vacant for much of President Obama's time in office. Saperstein is the head of the Religious Action Center for Reform Judaism. He was the first chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. It was created by Congress in 1999. As more American mothers work outside of the home, some fathers now stay home. The president's economic report says this can lead to new conflicts between work and family. Our White House correspondent Suzanne LaFranchi has more. The White House says the number of American women in the workforce has soared in the past 50 years. And while the surge in female workers is helping lead economic growth, it is also increasing pressure on families. In most families with children, both parents need to work. 60% today, compared to about 40% in 1968. But with more women going to work, more mothers are the family's primary breadwinner, 40% in 2011. 63% of mothers with young children work outside the home, double what it was 45 years ago. Meanwhile, fathers are spending less time doing paid work and more time on childcare and housework. And about 15% of stay-at-home parents are dads, double what it was 25 years ago. Working or at home, fathers are spending three times as long on family duty as they did 50 years ago. But for both mothers and fathers, balancing work and home has become increasingly difficult. 46% of parents complain their work life interferes with their family obligations. That's up from 41% just eight years ago. The president hopes to use this report to promote liberal policies such as paid family leave, paid sick leave, and workplace flexibility. From the White House, Suzanne LaFranchi, EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, Suzanne. Dr. Pat Fagan directs the Marriage and Religion Research Institute at the Family Research Council. And Dr. Fagan, the administration's economic case is that more women working is good for our economy. Agree or disagree? Well, the Economic Council misreads the economy, misreads what's happening to women, I think mainly to advance a liberal feminist agenda. Um, the way it misreads it, actually. The out-of-wedlock births and the massive rise in divorce over this thing forces women to go out to work. It's not that they're, as it were, choosing freely, I've, I, w I want to work, I got this talent. I must work because I don't have a husband. Some. 
Some do choose, but there are some a do. Large, That's right. of course. a large number that have no choice. I've got children who went to Ivy League schools and are exercising their I do too. Way. I've got nothing against that. I'm talking about the reading. In an economic report by the Economic Council, uh, you expect to get the economics right. The other thing that is there, there's been a massive drop, a 20% drop from uh, just below 90 to now just below 70% of men out of the workforce, you got this huge drop. It's not talking about that. I'm sure a fair percentage of those dads who are at home is because they can't get a job. Second thing, it massively, it, it totally ignores the impact of marriage on the economy, which is huge. It totally ignores the impact of the mother at home on the economy of the family and the economy at large. So you have a concern that this economic analysis really tries to separate marriage from family, doesn't it? Marriage from the economy. We're talking economics here. It's one of the huge boosts to the economy. Let me give you an example. Most of the savings in this country happens to married families. Most of the savings in this country is the economic investment infrastructure, the capital infrastructure of the biggest economy in the world. It's that important. Marriage is that important to the economy, and most people are unaware. Of the, council, the President's Council of Economic Advisors, you expect world-class economics. This is not that at all. Don't it's you a, think perhaps the economic value of women working at home is being overlooked here? Totally. And the economic value of women at home is hidden, and most people don't know it. The way you can get a sense of it is when a mother has to go out to work, what are all the things that have to be replaced? the cooking, the cleaning, the child care, the care of husbands and all that. It's estimated, with some of the best studies, for a middle class college graduate to go out to work, she needs to earn over 100000 for the family to benefit more than when she was at home. And certainly this idea of incentivizing women to work outside of the home, that's not really good policy, is it? It's not good family policy. Now, women have the choice, for instance, after the kids are grown or anywhere in between, that a woman wants to go out to work. Nothing against that. I have three daughters it. doing it very successfully. What's happening right now, however, is that there's a huge portion of families who have to go out, where a mother has to go out to work to help, to help the family survive economically. The measure of the economy ought to be how good is it at providing the family with what it needs? And our economy has less and less that capacity. In the past, dad could work and then mother was free to choose if she wanted to. That freedom is gone for a lot of couples. Dr. Pat Fagan, we appreciate your insight. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Coming up, baby, it's cold outside. Millions of Americans face sub-zero temperatures with no weekend relief in sight and he may soon be recognized as a saint. We introduce you to a Grand Master of the Sovereign Order of Malta. On this Friday evening, the first Friday of Lent, thanks for joining us, I'm Brian Patrick. The Washington State florist being sued for refusing to provide flowers for the wedding of a gay couple will not settle out of court. 70-year-old Baron L. Stutzman and her lawyers responded to an offer from the Attorney General saying they will take this to trial. The state says she is guilty of unlawful discrimination. Stutzman says she is acting according to her faith. She chooses not to use her creative skills to beautify a wedding ceremony she finds morally objectionable. Kerry Kupek is an attorney with the Alliance Defending Freedom, the legal counsel for the Washington State Florist. And Father Dominic uh, Legg, Dominican, is a former lawyer for the U.S. Department of Justice. So Kerry, why appeal? Why not simply settle? They've offered you a settlement. The state of Washington has sent a very clear, disturbing message to the people there. If you dare disagree with the state's ideology on marriage and don't use your creative talents to celebrate and promote it, you will face professional and personal ruin, and that's why we're appealing it. So they call this discrimination. Does it compare with refusing to serve someone for their race or ethnicity? Absolutely not. And for starters, Baronelle never refused service to Rob. In fact, she faithfully served him for nine years. They became friends. She sold him flowers for everything that he asked for. It was this one ceremony that she said because of her faith in Jesus Christ, she could not use her talents to endorse. So to compare that to the horrific subjugation that our country 
put African Americans through for so many years. Uh, everything from denying them, like you said, you know, service at a lunch counter to uh, debating whether or not they counted as a whole human being is ludicrous and is really distracting from the issue at hand. So she did not discriminate against the individuals. She is refusing then to do this service. And Father Dominic, doesn't this really have to do with cooperating or sh appearing to show approval for something we consider morally wrong? I think that's exactly the issue. There's no question that a Catholic would sell groceries or flowers or provide services for a homosexual person. The issue is participating in uh, what, from a Catholic perspective, is uh, morally wrong. And if you show your approval for that or you are implicated in that, uh, that is a moral act on your part. And the Supreme Court is considering a case that could really create a protective status under federal law. What implications would that have for Catholics and the Catholic Church? Well, so the Supreme Court this term is looking at uh, the question of homosexual unions and possibly gay marriage. If they were to decide that um, uh, being, that sexual orientation, for example, is a protected category under the Constitution and that there can be no discrimination based on that category, it would mean, for example, that uh, potentially Catholic schools would be obliged to hire someone who might set himself forth as a practicing uh, gay activist even. Uh, you couldn't say, no, that, that's out of bounds for a Catholic school. It could create a lot of problems. Is there a difference in this case that you're dealing with in the, in the Hobby Lobby case? Well, the principle remains the same. The Supreme Court in Hobby Lobby Conestoga said that you don't check your beliefs at the door when you go to work. However, the reason uh, federal refer doesn't come into play here is because we're dealing with state and local laws. All right, Kerry Kupek and Father Dominic Legg, thank you both. We appreciate your insight in the story. Thanks thank very much. You. Well, pilgrims from more than 30 countries attended a special mass and ceremony at the Vatican today. More than a thousand filled the Basilica of St. John Lateran, honoring Englishman Fra Andrew Bertie. This marks the first time in the history of the Order of Malta one of the leaders of that order has been proposed for sainthood. Fra Berti is known for promoting humanitarian work in the order and emphasizing spiritual life among its members. La carita. Charity was the main characteristic of this life that included an intense life of prayer, that is, the intimate relationship with God. Many who attended today's Mass belong to the Order of Malta, including the celebrant Cardinal Raymond Burke. It's been only five years since Fra Berti's death. That is the minimum time allowed before the beatification process can begin. Bitter cold is gripping much of the eastern half of the U.S. and showing no sign of letting up. This latest Arctic blast could plunge parts of the southeast and mid-Atlantic into deep freezes not felt since the mid-90s. The cold snap with record low temperatures followed snow and ice storms earlier in the week. Forecasters warn that more sleet and freezing rain is possible in the coming days. Many weekend events could be canceled due to power outages and dangerous driving conditions. Be careful. Tourists are braving sub-zero temperatures to see an icy spectacle surrounding Niagara Falls. Trees around the falls are encased in icy shells. The falls themselves aren't completely frozen, but the massive ice buildup near the brink has become a tourist magnet. Things aren't expected to thaw out soon. Temperatures dipped to seven below in Niagara Falls this morning. It seldom snows in the Holy Land, but roads leading in and out of Jerusalem are clogged with heavy snow tonight. The city looks like a picture postcard covered with a white blanket. The Golden Dome of the Rock and other traditional Jerusalem landmarks in the Old City are capped by several inches of snow. Nearly four inches had fallen by this morning, with more expected throughout the day. Up next, Catholics in Asia integrate Lenten charity into their Chinese New Year celebrations. And on this first Friday of Lent, Mark Irons takes us on a journey to find fast food deals on fish sandwiches. Cheers to Friday. Yes. On this Friday evening, the 20th of February, thanks for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick with the EWTN News Nightly team. Argentines demand answers in the mysterious death of a prosecutor. The Wall Street Journal says a quarter million people were involved in this week's silent march in Buenos Aires. That mark marched a march marked a month since the death of Alberto Nisman. He was found dead the day before he was to present his allegations against President Christina Kirchner to Congress. Nisman believed Kirchner and others reached a secret deal with Iran to shield officials allegedly involved in a 1994 bombing. The president denies the allegations. That attack killed 85 people at a Jewish community center in Buenos Aires. 
We're using Skype to connect with Maria Beltrami, a lawyer and legislative director for an Argentine senator. You marched in the silent march. Why? I did. We marched because it's a question of asking for justice, and it was a sort of way to honor uh, the DA that died in, you know, with such a strong cause to find the truth behind the bombings of uh, the AMIA. So back what, is, in what is the political climate in Argentina right now? Well, right now it's very, uh, it's very. I guess I could, you could say, murky. It's we're just kind of waiting the, waiting out the elections, just hoping to wait out this government and um, not to cause any more debacles because it's been quite a very, very rough year, especially last year and this year. Just looks pretty tough. Well, the Argentine government has been all over the place on this. Does it support or oppose Catholic issues at this point in history? You know, frankly, it's we really don't know. It seems, I mean, they, they suppose, I guess, for a sort of press uh, issue, they do because the Pope is from Argentina and it is not politically correct right now to oppose any Catholic issues. But uh, the left here, which is, you know, who, who is behind uh, President Kirshner, does absolutely not support any Catholic issues whatsoever. So as a Catholic, what is it like to work in politics there in Argentina right now? Um, it's, it's very hard, to be honest, because you have to fight against uh, a lot of, we have a lot of moral issues going on. You know, abortion was put back on the table last year, as well as the whole, you know, reviewing the whole gay marriage issue. So it's, it's not easy to be a practicing uh, and faithful Catholic uh, in politics right now. However, Pope Francis has uh, given us quite a hand there in dealing with certain issues, All especially right. corruption. Certainly. Maria Beltrami joining us from Buenos Aires by Skype. Maria, thank you so much. Thank you. So on this first Friday of Lent, when as Catholics we abstain from meat, many of us will eat fish. Last year at this time, Mark Irons found that Lent drives a seasonal fast food trend. Lent is a time of fasting. It's also a time of buy one, get one fish fillet sandwich. Fast food? Thanks for choosing McDonald's, how can I help you? Yeah, I was curious, uh, what's the deal with these fish sandwiches? They're buy one, get one free. Buy one, get one free, really? The fast food giant is offering this special for a limited time. Coincidence? I have no idea. I don't know. Why are you guys doing this special now? I'm really not sure. Maybe McDonald's just in a good mood to give away free fish fillet. Maybe. But at nearby Catholic University, this business major thinks it's something else. With as many Catholics there are in the country, I think it's a very special and unique business tactic. Cheers to Friday. Yes. Yeah. The filet fish was actually invented by a McDonald's restaurant owner in the 60s. He was trying to meet the needs of his largely Catholic community. But not everyone is a fan of the sandwich. Are you Catholic? It's the Lenten season? I'm gluten free. <laughs> gluten free, all right. Many fast food restaurants offer fish specials or fish options that seem to come to shore for the Lenten season and then head back to sea when it's over. If you find yourself rolling through the drive through this Lent, remember, the meat can wait. Could I do a uh, buy two, get two free? Sure, you sure can. Excellent. But keep in mind the point is to fast. Thank you very much. And maybe giving up fast food isn't a bad idea either. Free fish! Free fish? Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. Oh, thank you, Mark. Of course, that was last year, so I'm not sure if that, that special still holds. Asian Catholics are uniting traditional Chinese New Year celebrations and Lenten charitable activities. As fireworks continue to usher in the Year of the Sheep, Asian News reports missionaries in Hong Kong launched a support program for prisoners. South Korean Catholics sent containers filled with medical aid for tuberculosis patients in the north. And the Church of the Philippines is asking the faithful to give a new impetus to a program serving the poor. Well, we thank you for joining us tonight and all throughout this week. Until Monday, we encourage you to like us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter. Watch again on EWTN's YouTube page. For the entire EWTN News Nightly team, I'm Brian Patrick. Have a great weekend. Good night, and may God bless you.